gossip. <laughs> Everybody surviving GDC so far? That's about how I feel too. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the post party day talks are always the interesting talks. <laughs> Uh, first, a couple of housekeeping reminders. Please remind attendees to fill out the session evaluation email they receive from surveys.itninternational.com after each session they attend. Um, also, if we want to just, just uh, continue this afterwards, uh, there is a wrap-up room afterwards, although this, is, I believe, is the last uh, audio session. This is the wrap-up Headlining. Room. Headlining. Yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, obviously, turn your phones to vibrate. It's always embarrassing when uh, audio person has their phone ring in a, uh, in a talk and whatnot. Um, so uh, I'm very excited. I was uh, asked to uh, moderate this panel set up by some of the um, uh, folks at SMUEL. Um, and we kind of were trying to figure out what, what made, really made sense in terms of interactivity and the kinds of stuff that, that goes on. And we ended up with this notion of where does the game end and the instrument begin, right? There's a whole lot of uh, interesting things that, you know, device, you know, Massive amounts of compute power, you know, from a historical standpoint, right here, can give you, as well as the kind of cool things that are, you know, happen, whether it's Morpheus or HoloLens or uh, Magic Leap or Connect or all of these sorts of other kinds of things or plastic guitars. Um, and so it really, essentially, has opened up a whole big genre of categories of, I don't even know what to call them, you know. Map, new applications or something like that. Cool ways to make music and have compute power really help you do it. Um, so I would like, uh, our, we have an incredible set of expertise on the panel in terms of this goes. Matt Botch, John Moldover, uh, Nick uh, and David. And I'd like you to go down and introduce yourselves and just say a little bit about who you are and what, uh, what you've been working on. Yeah, my name is Matt Bach. I work at Harmonix Music Systems. Uh, I got my start working in rock band hardware, designing drums and guitars and making sure that they worked, and then uh, worked on all the rock band pro stuff. And then from there, I uh, started prototyping for Dance Central, uh, worked on all three of the Dance Central games, and most recently, I creative directed Fantasia Music Evolved, uh, a collaboration between Harmonix and Disney Interactive. It's a reimagining of the classic 1940s film, Fantasia. Um, yeah. I'm David Young. I'm at Smule. Uh, I am on our content team, which is the team responsible for all of the music or really any other content that comes out in all of our different music apps. Uh, I currently handle all of our pre-production scheduling licensing, which is a whole fun thing if you want to ask me about. Um, and all of that for our, our music releases. And before that, I was a content producer for Smule for over a year, and I did a bunch of the musical arrangements that some of you maybe have played in Magic Piano or Sing or Guitar. Hello. Uh, my name is Nicholas Benardi, the lead audio designer at Ubisoft San Francisco, and I am one of the unfortunate people that has one of these mics instead of that one. I love those instead, but it's okay. Um, yeah, so I work at Ubisoft San Francisco. Um, it's Ubisoft San Francisco is a newer studio. Uh, it's actually right down the street. Um, third and Brannon, uh, but we're mostly known for Rocksmith, and as far as my involvement with Rocksmith, I was working on it from the beginning, uh, before it actually even was at Ubisoft. So I was one of the original people working on it, uh, designed a lot of the game along with uh, Paul Cross and now Higo, the producer on the project. The three of us kind of built up the studio from there. Uh, amazing experience coming out with Rocksmith 1 and then Rocksmith 2014, the most recent one, um, and that's what I am still currently doing. Rocksmith is still alive, and we're releasing DLC three to five songs every week. Um, yeah, we'll get into more of that later. Hi, uh, John Moldover from Smule, senior programmer over there, and we're, we're neighbors with this guy, so we're in town. <laughs> and um, hello to you guys in the front on the left. You can feel free to come forward, but... Um, Let's see, so I work on Magic Piano at Smule, I did a lot of that, and sing karaoke, and before that, been at um, a bunch of game studios around the Bay Area, I worked on uh, DJ Hero for Activision for a bit, and um, nowadays I'm working on music videos at Smule, which is kind of cool, and um, yeah, it's good for now. Cool. So, so how, as, you know, people have been working directly on technology that you know, sort of empowers people to 
learn music or make music in ways that we don't think, you know, normally music is you take your piano lessons and you, or you study the violin or you, you know, do marching band or whatever. But it seems like uh, the devices and some of the early Smule and current Smule products are very, um, you know, let's make it easy for somebody to get up and, and sound something cool. So how, what kind of, you know, thought or empowerment goes into making these kinds of things such they, they're cool instrument musically, but at the same time, um, not just something where it does so much of the work for you that you're really just kind of pressing a bunch of presets. I think whatever, um, whatever application you're using, whatever your input device is, whether you're just touching the, the iPad or whether you have a, a controller or an actual instrument or even just your voice, whatever your input device is, the point of it, like you said, is to get somebody participating with the music as quickly as possible. Um, at least coming from learning guitar, this is like a classic problem with guitar, right? You go out, you buy a guitar, for some reason you're inspired, maybe you're in college or something, and you bring it home and you have a really hard time making the chords and you don't know what you're doing, then you go and look at tablature and that doesn't really help you, it's harder to read it, and maybe you do know exactly what you're supposed to do with tablature and you, and you take the time to put into it, um, but you're just, you're really disconnected from the, the goal. And the goal is just like, I want to play along with a Bon Jovi song right now. I don't want to wait months and months and months. And sure enough, you pour months and months and months into the guitar and you're still not really getting to what you want. Like, as far as our goal, and I believe that this was the same for you guys, it's about how, what is the least amount of effort that I need to be instantly be able to play with the music and connect to the music, because that's what I want to do. And then once you get that, you've actually inspired somebody, you're motivating them, and then you can take them to do whatever else you wanted. Go ahead, pick it up. Go ahead. <laughs> you're, you're, you're hesitating. <laughs> um, I agree mostly. Um, I think our battle is on that front end where you wanted to make it super easy for somebody, but and, and you mentioned in your original question is, do you make it to, where do you, where's the line where you, it's so easy that you're like, oh, I'm just pressing buttons or I'm, I'm interfacing it exactly when it's telling me to interface and then I'm, at that point I'm just, you know, I have a set of commands and I have to follow them. And I'm thinking more about following the commands than I am actually expressing the idea of music and it, the expressivity, which was um, uh, you guys' presentation yesterday kind of touched on a little bit, which was, which was cool. And so, yeah, that's like with Magic Piano, and John can talk more about that, but it's like the, you know, as, as the little fireflies drop down, the, they'll, they'll wait for the player, and, you know, there's the, the, the ebb and flow of actually having some control over, over tempo and, and dynamics and stuff of that nature. Yeah, I think we found, like uh, Nick said, like getting there quickly is super critical. Um, for the majority of our users, at least, who are not, like, I want to learn guitar, they're like, you know, mobile app users, maybe gamers, music lovers, um, it does not take very much for them to feel like get some ownership over it. It really was enough for them just to be like, oh, I can change this. Like, I have some amount of control. Yeah, it's not intimidating at all. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> Definitely don't want to intimidate them for sure. But it, it, didn't, it doesn't take a whole lot to give them that, that feeling. Um, of course, like, um, exactly how you do that um, is actually you know, a lot of work, the presentation, and like teaching people what seems like it should be super simple interface, like tapping a glowing thing on the screen, actually doesn't always elicit that from everyone. That's, that's probably the bigger challenge, I think, actually, is how do you like educate people like from nothing in as, uh, with as little friction as possible. Um, spend a lot of time on that, actually. In Fantasia, we're building a lot of sort of new gestural instruments, like kind of based on some vague concept of things like chaos pads, the like, kind of looking at accessible tools that people already use for these types of purposes. And one of the things that we found that really helps people understand that, you know, they've put in some arbitrary gestures that's super duper accessible, they're just moving their body. But the thing that changes that from just being some arbitrary movement to making them feel like they have some authorship is really just sort of abusing repetition. We will, you know, record the thing that you do and just keep playing it back to you. And, you know, you hear something once or twice in a row, you start to recognize what its melodic contours are, and then you start to feel a little bit of ownership of it. And so we re really used the sort of joy of repetition to give people a sense of ownership and authorship over the thing that they were doing. And that's cool, too. I think, like, all of our uh, applications are going to uh, a point where 
you want to do the thing where you're getting somebody participating right away, right? Because you want them to connect with the music and have fun. And especially important for Rocksmith because these are people who uh, have probably given up guitar once before. Right. <laughs> they, I mean, a, a lot of our, our user base were, were people who had guitars in their closet and they just couldn't connect to it before. But after you get them actually playing and connecting and playing their favorite songs and relating to it somehow, you want to go that other step. You want to say, you're not just repeating music that's coming at you. You're feeling like the notes you're playing are your own. You're feeling agency over what you're doing and you actually are putting in more. You're starting to actually make your own stuff. Like an, uh, decision we made early on with the, the first Rocksmith is we don't um, like knock your, we don't like uh, lower your score or anything for playing more notes. We just want you to play what's there. If you want to play stuff in between, if you want to solo on top of stuff, like absolutely go for it. And like there's interesting things that I see um, these type of apps doing where they're giving you places to like to start putting in more and start putting in more of you into it. And in fact, like the, the, a lot of your apps where you're actually sharing things and sending them back and forth between friends, it's implied, right? You're supposed to be doing that. It's like, I've sent this to you. I didn't just like, I didn't just like <laughs> copy something. I didn't copy someone else's homework and send it to you. <laughs> like I actually sang on this thing. It's me, it's my voice. I put in my own little like ah, kind of flurries mm -hmm. into it. Now it's your turn to do something with it. Like that. That stuff is implied and actually like makes the experience so much better. Well, and and it also goes to uh, the fact that music, yes, it can be a, a personal, secluded thing if you want it to be. But in the grand history of humanity and culture, music is a very collective experience that you want to share and interact with people, even across cultural and language boundaries. And, that's a big reason why we, we push that share stuff besides the fact that you have more engagement. <laughs> and it's totally an important thing to get to that point because I definitely remember when I, when I started playing music, I, it was not about playing it with other people. It was about like hair in my face, just like in, in, my, in my bedroom, lights off, like, <laughs> like not playing in front of every, anybody. Like I definitely had like stage fright and didn't really want to communicate with anybody. Like branching through that as a musician is really, really important because that's, mm -hmm. that's the point, right? You know, yeah. Like you said, you're, it is a social event. You're supposed to be playing with people. Do you think that's one of the reasons that some of the, uh, the, the social music games, I'm thinking like, like rock bands specifically, I mean, there was a phenomenon where all of a sudden there were ton, you know, lots of soccer mom rock band groups. Um, <laughs> And I, I think back a little bit to, you know, if you watch Amadeus, what did people do at parties? They play piano and sing, or play harpsichord and sing. Um, so do you think this, you know, talking about the sort of solo experience versus the, the group experience, is that something that's made much easier with the devices we have now? Or is that, is it almost sort of, in the way Facebook is sort of isolating, are we going the other way on that a little bit? Right, is being social making music, doing something on your own and sharing it? Or is it more of a, collaborative thing in art, and is that, do you see that being reflected in products or the way it might, maybe things would go in the future in terms of digital music making, digital personal music making? Uh, right out the gate, I guess I'll say that our mission statement is connecting people through music. So we are completely on the- So yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes and yes, no. Um, but the end. absolutely, um, but I'll, I'll let you guys chime in. Uh, I think in in general there's something that has kind of like a little bit happened with our society where we have we don't connect with music as well as we maybe used to like you said like oh people used to have fancy parties where they got around and played piano and everyone sang right whereas like nowadays especially or at least especially when I was growing up like I was really insecure about singing and didn't like openly do it and like there wasn't there wasn't like a lot of musically coming together and things besides like the required like singing classes in like elementary school or something like that um I think in general like for some reason we've kind of like branched away from that not necessarily with just singing or playing instruments but even like connecting over music in general like um like America used to be the central location for swing dancing, you know. Like that's that's a, a way of connecting with music. Like literally, you're you're dancing on the beat, right? We used to be the hub for that. Now we're not. Sweden is, <laughs> you know. Like other all the other countries across the world have been like swing dancing so great. You guys came up with this. It's like yes, I we don't do it anymore. I mean we do like it, it's just in an in like a, a very, very niche group of, of what it used to be. So 
I, I really like seeing um, types of mediums and types of applications that actually connect people back together, uh, back together musically like this. Yeah, and, oh, go ahead. I mean, I think rock band is certainly a communal experience. I think uh, to a degree that the fear of singing in front of people is part of the reason why uh, rock band is a, is a great product and a great experience, right? You get one person doing karaoke and three other people also get to participate in what rock band is without having to take the risk of singing. Um, I think that's certainly a big part of it. As we've, you know, continued to build all of our games, multiplayer is a thing that we sort of insist on having and we want to create shared musical experiences in your living room. Um, and, you know, people do a lot of kind of sharing of those, of their sort of skilled performances in rock band or the like uh, on YouTube. I tend not to think about that necessarily as musical sharing so much as proficiency sharing, right? Kind of bragging to a degree. Um, but with Fantasia, because every single performance that you're doing is generative in some way, uh, we have, you know, opened up YouTube sharing for that. And you do hear very, very different interpretations of all these different songs. People feel a bit of ownership over them, kind of looking at the YouTube comments and responding to each one. And, you know, I think they're, they're connecting with people uh, through the kind of uh, unique spin that they've taken on a given song and, you know, spreading that out across the internet. Uh, but it's possible for them to do that in their own living room with their own friend as well. And all of the sort of different compositional elements in Fantasia, we've also built for multiplayer. So you can do it in a sort of trading fours kind of way where you're creating half the phrase, the person creates the other half of the phrase. And those moments, we always see people look together, smile after they've done that, and then go back to playing the song because they, they built something together. And, you know, the best feeling, I think, like of ever being in a band is just drummer starts, bass player comes in, guitar player comes in and someone starts singing and when you're part of that you just, it just feels amazing even if your band is absolutely terrible even if the drummer's <laughs> not playing in time at all that, that sort of feeling of all coming together towards the same ends is just uh, ineffable it's amazing I was about to say that's exactly like we, you know all of us up here are musically inclined so we've all played music with a lot of people and we've had that moment where everyone in the band looks at each other it's like that moment that just happened and is happening right now, that like we all just clicked. There was the most awesome music thing that we all just innately did together, and it was this crazy connective thing. And good and, luck recording that moment. Yeah, I know, too. yeah. <laughs> it was definitely off or, or, or yeah. <laughs> I sort of think of the, those bursts of SoundCloud comments as, as the internet oh, yeah. doing this, right? Like the producer is and has everyone kind of looking at them at this moment because, you know, they've picked out some particular part of the song that they like, and you see a million comments pop up at the same time. Um, you know, if it's a dubstep song, that's definitively where the drop is. But in other types of music, it tends to be where interesting quality changes have happened. And I think you get that almost same feeling of, of eye contact, of validation, uh, and uh, you kind of are getting to do it in a larger and larger group, which is kind of amazing. That's, yeah. a, that's a funny thing I haven't thought about, looking at uh, dubstep songs on SoundCloud and being like, there's just one location where all of the comments are going to be. Oh, for sure. <laughs> oh, the beat dropped here. Oh, there's there's some, all these man, there's some analytics here, sick. for sure. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, back to Brian's original point, I wanted to say, um, in, in Smoo, like, the Magic Piano app, I think, is a more solitary experience. But I, I don't think it's, like, further, I don't know, isolating people. Um, I think that there's those people that want to play in their bedroom and they just want to get into a song and then do it in a, you know, personal way and, and just get something out. Um, but yeah, I think that the phone app technology can indeed be like putting people in their own virtual world and taking them away from the moment. We've all experienced that. There's probably some of you out there checking your Facebook right now, and that's cool. <laughs> I was doing that during the talks earlier. Um, <laughs> And that's cool. Um, but <laughs> that just, it's all right. If you want to do it, that's fine, I guess. Yeah. No, um, you and, right and you, could, you could levy that criticism on, on our apps. But um, I thought the interesting thing about Sing, actually, um, and, and like these guys were saying, like the, the coolest musical social experience, I think, is being with people in the same space. That shared moment is the magicalness of it. Um, so what can you do with mobile? What can you do with an app? Well, there's some other spaces you can still be social with in a different way. And, and I think with the sing karaoke, we get people to sing who like maybe aren't quite uh, outgoing enough to actually go to a karaoke bar or they don't have time to. They don't want to get in front of a room with other people, strangers they don't know, but they really like singing those songs and they'll sing them when they're comfortable in their own room and then they'll share that recording. And, and the so bathroom the, where they sound good. Yeah, yeah, yeah you got to get the, you know, 
you can't get, get the dialed. reflections of the bathroom. That's uh, that's ideal. Yeah, but um, but they'll share it, and and you know, I I listen to these people singing the songs a lot, and they're terrible sometimes. They're average because that's what people are. Um, but they really just enjoy the music, and they, it is a genuine, genuine social connection when they'll share them, and their, their girlfriend or whatever will sing the duet part. And it's, it's pretty cool. It's really um, it's exciting to me to see just ordinary people like making music, doing their own thing, not worrying about, like, am I as good as like, my favorite you know, musician? Like, no, it's not about that. We're just you know, making music. So before uh, Brian hits us up with another question and departs us from this, you said something about uh, recording, which was really interesting. Uh, or you, you're talking about that moment when you're all playing together and you look and you're like, yeah, this is the moment. And then, uh, and then I said something actually about recording. I'm like if you try to record that moment, it's gone. Uh, this is like, if you, if you guys are musicians and you ever jammed with people, you'll know this thing where you like try to record your jams because you're like, they're so brilliant, we come up with the coolest stuff. When you put down a tape recorder or anything, it's uh, nothing. You've got no ideas. It's only garbage. And, and you will never capture that moment. And I think it's, it's really interesting. We had this same kind of thing with... Um, well, it's just kind of capturing these moments in general. And like, it's when you are impromptu, just doing something with someone else and you don't have a lot of expectation, you don't think about it that much, those are when those moments happen. It's almost like they happen outside of the recording and it has nothing to do with it. It's a fact that it is just like a spontaneously kind of combined thing that, that makes those magic moments actually come to the front and makes you actually experience them. Um, yeah recording <laughs> and, and recording in general is just more of like a, a solitary experience like to a degree I mean okay so uh, I've been playing guitar for like 17 years 18 years at this point but I also took a long detour into uh, electronic music and that is solitary <laughs> recording experience that is like I am up all night because I had like a triple shot uh, latte and it's four in the morning and I'm tweaking knobs on this synth for way too long like <laughs> I, I really like the idea of of this doing it on the fly of like just like even the the stuff that happened with um the later games where you could just drop in in the middle of playing you know or like oh I'm, i want to play with my friend just add them now it's like that really informalness makes these moments kind of happen instead of like pushing it to a more structured experience like recording would be i think it is nice though that that recording does enable folks who might have a lot of performance anxiety to be able to do their performance on their own terms in their own time and then share that with the rest of the world. And I think that's a, a, a really nice aspect of uh, app-based karaoke, right? There's so much about uh, the, the karaoke experience that is just in being you, being the person singing that song. Um, but you know, if you are paralyzed with fear at the point in time which you have to mm -hmm. sing in front of other people, uh, it's not really a thing you can do anymore. Uh, certainly, I think there's plenty of singers out there who kick everyone else out of the studio when it's time to do their vocal takes. Like, it's, it's a thing where you, you want to be alone with yourself. Um, but it's nice that, that those alone moments can be shared and that, you know, you don't have to have a microphone set up and preamps and whatever else. You're just giving people that. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a thing that I'm sure we've all done, recorded and shared music, but enabling other people to do that is amazing. Uh, we saw a really interesting, I guess, representation of this when our... So we have a Sing, Sing is our karaoke app, and karaoke can kind of be a bad word <laughs> and a, a divisive <laughs> word. And so, you know, we're trying to do everything we can in the app to make it not the, the side of karaoke that people hate, which is the drunk person in a bar slaughtering a song and everyone, like, wincing and listening to it. Those or, are the times I like karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> it, has a, it has its moments, but uh, I don't know if I need to sit down and... <laughs> hear that as a musician, but uh, we didn't have video up until um, October, and once the video switch happened, you don't have to do perform on video, but the entire element of, well, at least I can still hide behind my, you know, my profile image and just record this, now it's like, oh, now you're going to see me in my bedroom, like, performing, and it's messy, and I... Uh, a lot of people like do their makeup and do their hair and get everything ready and just the the interesting seeing the ways that people got more engaged because they're on video and then the other people that got less engaged and just stuck to still doing audio only because they were intimidated by being on video. Yeah, it's different personality types. Some people uh, like to perform more and like that aspect and are artists in that realm and will put a lot more energy in there, whereas other people are. Uh, 
just more of that don't like performing but still like music. So you get the like, um, you know, in the closet recording musicians like, like myself. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, the people who say like, okay, the rest of the band, I'm kicking you out of the studio or I'm recording my vocal tracks at home to get this done. Uh, yeah, different, different personality types interfacing with music in different ways. And the cool thing that, that I see in, in our apps is that we have inroads for all of those different types. So there is like an inroad for the person who wants to record by themselves. Well, there is also a way for everyone to just play together and not worry about recording and stuff like that. Yeah. More roads. <laughs> More roads. Well, there's a way in which just proposing that this thing is a game takes the stakes down, right? Like if, if you're right. telling someone, okay, you need to perform a musical phrase, write some music, versus, hey, just like, we're playing this game, it's all cool, don't worry about it. There, there's a way in which it just it gives you an excuse to be expressive, and that kind of framing of that musical experience, I think, just makes the whole thing less intimidating uh, simply by framing it in a different way for the player. Also, too, when you say it's a game, right. people don't, be mi and don't mind being told what to do at first. You know, whereas uh, if, you're, if you're doing an artistic endeavor of, w of whatever sort, like, I don't know if you, how many of you like, took a lot of like, art in high school, but like, it's, it seems like even the people in high school are like, oh, you should be drawing this. This is our project. I don't want to draw that. I want to draw this other thing. You know, it's like, it's like suddenly you're, oh, this is like who I'm supposed to be, so I'm going to do whatever I want. Whereas in a video game, gamers are very used to saying, hold X to run. Okay, thanks for telling me that. I'll hold X to run. This doesn't have anything to do about me being artistic. I just need to know the tools, uh, which is ironically what they were trying to teach you in art class in the first place. But You mentioned making an, art, I forgot the phrase you used, an artistic expression. Is that the ultimate goal of your products? Is, is there a continuum between artistic expression and have a really good time, or is that just, or, you know, just play different, around with Different stuff? personalities, different goals. Um, good question. Yeah. Or is this something you, is one of the challenges sort of trying to morph people somewhere along that continuum and have them start as fun, and before they know it, they're doing something kind of artistic? So something that we definitely did with, the, uh, with Rocksmith 2014, with the second Rocksmith, is that we didn't try to assume where people wanted to go or what they wanted to do or how they wanted to learn or what they should be or anything. We opened it up so that, and we, and we made the, um, the UI like very much kind of follow this flow where if you just want to learn a song, let's say you're a guitar or you want to learn how to play guitar, you just want to learn a song, great. Let's say you want to go do lessons first, you can do that first. Let's say you don't even care about any of that, you just want to play mini games. Like we let you go wherever and then the system adapted around that to say like, okay, they kind of, they chose this song, they're doing this, they're doing this. This means that they kind of want these things, they kind of want to go this direction. Let me start teaching them this way. Let me start suggesting things to them this way and tell them about other places in the game that they can go. Um, to answer your question, it's like different personality types are after different things, right? There, and it's like the, there's, I guess the person who would just want to get every note correct and play it with exactly the right tone and exactly the right way and like reproduce this thing as, as accurately as possible would be in, in our terms somewhere along the lines of like the completest, right? Where in a normal game, they would be the person who's, I beat every mission, I beat every side mission, everything is perfect, I've done everything I possibly can. Whereas there are other people who um, will play a song, maybe not learn all of it, like maybe kind of improvise or screw around on top of it, maybe afterwards turn off the game and like take that little bit and turn it to a song of their own. Different goals for different people. And we didn't really, um, with Rocksmith 2014, we left it open so we didn't make any assumptions about who you were and what you wanted to do. We let you kind of go with it and, and guided you along the way to your goals. I mean, the mission statement of Harmonix is to, you know, offer non-musicians the experience of making music. I think over the continuum of the various harmonics products, we sort of started with a joystick-based uh, jazz freestyle ink product called the Axe. It's like really, really early on in harmonics days. Um, and then from there, we've kind of, we really focused on, I think, performance simulation. Um, and I think Fantasia was the moment when we got back to the aspect of, of sharing the process of making music with a, a broad population. That certainly has been, I think, an overarching goal, an overarching agenda for the entirety of the company. We think we were hugely successful with things like Rock Band of sharing the feeling of performing music, but it's a quite different thing to share the feeling of ownership and pride that you might get when you have done a particular uh, unique thing that only you could have done. 
And so certainly as we're going through the process of building Fantasia, we're trying to figure out what types of interactions would net sufficient complexity such that the outcomes would be unique every single time. There were millions upon millions of outcomes, but that it was really hard to uh, paint outside of the lines, right? To, inter to, to take, essentially what we did is take a lot of, you know, what we understand, the rules that bind Western music, make the system know those rules, and not ever let people do things that are outside of those rules. So we do allow people to make this sort of artistic expression. It's certainly a thing that we think is you know, core to that game, core to the promise of that game. Um, but we lower the stakes by making it very difficult, nigh on impossible, to make what sounds like a mistake, what is sort of traditionally a mistake. You make it hard for them to sound bad. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Put any of yourself into this, and we're going to make it sound good to some degree. That is like uh, something that I feel like music games are going in the direction of and can do more and more and more of. Because right now you see there's a lot, like especially on your phone, if you download a lot of like music making apps for the phone, there's very few of them that are actually geared towards like game and make music and have fun. There are a couple, don't let me say that there's not. Um, but you'll very quickly run into the area where you're like, whoa, I downloaded a DAW, a digital audio workstation like Pro Tools or Logic basically is on my phone, all the buttons are super small. Okay, uh, I've gone over the deep end. Um, that's why I like stuff, I was, I was talking to David before this about um, Smule's rap uh, app where you just record your voice saying anything and then it uh, takes a little bit of processing time and then turns it into a rap and they have the, a video online uh, where I, I don't know the guy's name but he was doing uh, uh, Beavis and Butthead Cornholio and just like report, <laughs> <laughs> just reciting Cornholio, almost like Shakespearean, you know? Um, and then it just turned it into a rap, and I'm like, wow, that's great. It's doing a lot of stuff. You put in whatever input, whatever piece of yourself, right, that you want to put in. It doesn't have to be Beavis and Butthead, it can be whatever. Uh, and then it takes that and actually turns it into a song afterwards, and you can see all of the, or you can start to hear all of the intelligent, like, oh, yeah, we're grabbing this, that's clearly the same as that. We're gonna make a phrase out of this, we're gonna make a phrase out of this. And they don't know what we did, but we made a song out of it, you know, like that, that type of, um, you can't screw this up uh, ways of making music is, is great because I feel like there's a lot of, um, in general, I mean, that we, we, we've faced a lot of this with Rocksmith, but there's a lot of intimidation to playing an instrument or making a song. If you just put a guitar in somebody's hands, they play your own song immediately and they've never played before, like, that's it. They're never going to play guitar again. <laughs> like, you have to approach it very carefully. I think there are lessons that are coming from, from not only from games, but also from sort of DAW and uh, hardware manufacturers and the like. Yeah. You look at things like Ableton Push or the most recent set of like complete keyboards. But a lot of these features are just to get rid of any of those exact same types of mistakes. You sort of like set your push grid to exactly the scale that you want. Now you're dealing with, you know, what kind of was a piano, but now is a subset of the keys that you would want to play. Um, and I think it's, it's a thing that's useful for people that uh, are musicians and could ignore those notes, but they know they aren't going to need them because their song is in one key, it's hanging out there. Uh, I think those types of uh, accessible interfaces are, are happening both on the sort of music instrument manufacturing side uh, and from the game side. And there's interesting places where they meet in the middle. I think we've seen a lot of cool products, things like uh, Cosmic DJ is a game I really love. It's a game where you, you sequence little things and they all they build a song for you. Uh, Fract has these uh, similar types of creative elements. Um, and I, th I think seeing... Uh, music technology move in that direction as music games move in that direction. It seems like there's, an, there's a really generative and interesting space forming in between those two things. Mm -hmm. it, it's not something I, that we have anything that solves in any way, but I worry a little bit that going too far in this direction eliminates the possibility for a casual music person that's using any one of our products to experience music either for the first time or on the, on the side, and that's not their main thing. The, the happy accidents that happen yeah. when you don't have those restrictions and sitting down at a piano yeah, yeah. and accidentally plunking that wrong note but then being like, wow, hold on, that was actually really cool if I just like changed this thing and all of a sudden you're in this totally new area and it was all because of a happy accident. I think a lot of great moments in music uh, happen out of happy accidents. There's two different... Yeah, you're right. Two different. We've... Uh, we've uh, so back to your initial question, like that continuum, we're on the continuum, we start at having a good time, we need to make sure everyone's there, and that seems to be kind of like the, the bottom line, literally the bottom line. And then where does it get to artistic expression? Well, we've kind of capped it by making sure everything sounds good and, and those happy accidents don't happen. So we've like limited that universe of what you can do. 
Artistic's a pretty strong word. I don't think we ever use that, right? That's kind of scary. I, don't I know. regretted saying it when I said it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's good though. I um, appreciate it. But yeah, it, it is. I think you're absolutely right, and that's 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 a problem. This Are there people we're like losing who are like, yeah, I can take negative feedback. I don't need my stuff to always sound good. You know, I can I can deal. Like, are we just losing all those people? Some people can take negative feedback. Some people can't take negative feedback very well. Uh, there's kind of two philosophies on this. And this just in, isn't just in music. And I'm so glad I have a segue to talk about this. But, like, there's a lot of suggestive media out there now, right? Or su suggesting media. Like uh, Netflix, like your Facebook timeline, like uh, Hulu. The, the, you know, there's plenty of other things that suggest to you what you want, right? Um, and the more and more stuff you go in that direction, and the more and more stuff you buy, or the more and more radicalized you end up getting, right? Uh, and it really kind of narrows your focus on the world. So uh, this is this is kind of like becomes a problem because, like, I, I think a general philosophy is you want to be a well-rounded person. The more ways you have to enjoy life, the more of a well-rounded person you are, the more chances are that you're going to enjoy life or enjoy the thing that you're doing. Uh, Destiny just gave a talk where they were talking about this. And I'm obsessed with the game, sorry. Um, <laughs> but they were talking about this and they, they talked about their goal of they were doing all of this data mining on their users and their goal was to make people well-rounded players because then if one of their venues kind of dropped off, if it's like, oh, my friends stopped playing, now they don't stop playing. They have so many other ways of doing this, right? And it's kind of like the same thing with music. Um, in this, or in this talk of like, where do you let the happy accident happen and where do you guide the person to the happy accident, right? I think in general, music has been, like music and music games have been a little bit behind the curve of getting there. I think like, I don't know, I think we have a little bit more of a way to go until we get to the Facebook uh, newsfeed point where it's like, wow, we have radicalized people to an insane degree. They don't know what notes sound like out of the major scale. We need to just throw in some locri and we need to just shake them up, you know? <laughs> I, I don't think we're there yet, although I am, I am totally behind what you're saying. In Why do we need to do that? Why do we need to shake them up? Why do we need what if they're happy just listening to major chords? Oh, sure. No, no, and, and most, people, most people will be, and, that's, and that's, that's totally fine. But in general, like, and, you know, that was the complaint people had with Destiny. I don't want to play as a Titan. I'm a warlock. <laughs> like, why did you give me a Titan helmet, damn it? Um, but... <laughs> In general, like I, uh, I really have a philosophy that it's it's a goal to be a more well-rounded person. Just in general, it will give you more of a way to enjoy life, uh, enjoy music, right? Like something that I did when I was in music school is if I found a genre of music I didn't like, I'm like, okay, I just put it on and listen to it, and, like try to figure it out. Like I, I really wasn't into reggae, like when I was in high school, just really not. It took me a long time to figure out how to get into reggae. Um, and I wouldn't say it's my favorite thing, but the thing is I understand now. And I feel like, um, especially with music in general, like it's so polarizing, you know? Like metal fans are metal fans. Like blues fans are blues fans. Like there's things to enjoy on both sides. And the merging of that only makes your users more robust to the stuff you have to offer them in the first place. Well, what is better in, in, uh, in us projecting musical experiences and giving people interfaces is ignorance is bliss, and I don't like, I can't do that wrong note. I don't even know that wrong note exists because I don't know that, that that's a scale. Uh, versus people who, oh uh, no, I want to know all of the dark secrets of music, and like, I want all 12 notes. No, I want, like, all, you know, there's the, there's the, like you were saying, there's, there's different kinds of people, but. You can have these three notes right now. <laughs> Later on, we'll give you some more notes. Yeah. Well, and, and DLC. It's like, it's like the Oreo experiment. <laughs> yeah, <with> DLC. <laughs> you, can, you can pay for those extra notes in the scale, yeah. The piano, the piano as an instrument has internalized just as much of Western music logic as yeah. anything else, right? Like, like okay. we're, we're saying, oh, here's all this open possibility, right? But there's yeah. plenty of frequencies that exist in between the notes and the piano. Yeah, a piano dictates to you yeah. what kind of music you're going to make, like any sort of app or any sort of thing we're designing. And I think uh, far be it for me personally to be able to say what the bounds of artistic expression are uh, and... and to suggest that some particular type of musical complexity makes for more valid or more well-rounded work. From my perspective, like I love a lot of sort of weird and, and strange novel genres of music that exist. Gamelon, Sing and, well, sure, yeah. Gamelon, but like you know, there's contemporary music like say uh, Jersey Club or uh, electronic or, classical noise music. You know, contemporary. Like, <laughs> for 12 minutes, and you're like, I don't know how I'm 
I supposed to feel about that? In a 15.4 <laughs> setup, right, yeah. Right, in a 15.4. <laughs> there, yeah, there, uh, there was um, a performance space down here a while ago that was so awesome, so awesome, but it was the most niche thing ever. I forget, I think it was, I, I forget the, the name of the studio, but it was a performance space for really, really specific artists, and it was this room about this size, and there were projectors all along the side, so it was like a full 360 view, and it was, yeah, 15 point eight surround sound like like in a in a in a circle not just around you and they played the loudest craziest shows there and it was totally awesome in this incredibly niche thing yeah but they played like crazy out electronic like noise core there was one guy i saw perform with only radios turned up and he was just mixing five different radios and it has nothing to do with what we're talking about <laughs> well so i, I, I want to give a brief anecdote um uh, John Stuart Mill, the founder of utilitarianism, uh, was, was a, a, a really interesting thinker. And at some point in time in his life, he decided he was going to commit suicide. And the reason he wanted to commit suicide was because he'd done some math. He looked at the, the notes that existed that we could hear and, you know, the bounds that he thought music had, you know, the types of instruments that could be played, et cetera, et cetera. And he realized that there was a mathematical formula he could build that would create all the music that would ever exist. And he was like, it's not worth it. I'm getting out of here. Um, and I think what he misses is that music is bigger than that, right? We certainly have the option to have all sorts of timbre. We have vocal performances. We have a lot of uh, opportunities for specific or for specificity that exist outside of musical complexity. And I think when you know you read a lot of the things of like, oh, music is narrowing, and all music sounds the same now, and you can see New York Times articles about this like maybe once a year. I think we don't give enough. Uh, attention to what timbre means and uh, what sampling means and what calling back to previous types of music means. I think there's no way we can ever run out of musical possibility and I think that, uh, that the same notion that underpins the, the idea that we could run out of musical possibility is the same kind of strange notion of saying, oh, uh, we need to give people this much space to express themselves. One cannot run out of musical uh, possibility within their lifetime. So, uh, Go ahead. I, I want, quick thing on that is that, all right, let's look at where music is heading, and that, that's a loaded topic, absolutely. But <laughs> uh, it, timbre is a huge, huge part of that, to the point that we've talked a lot so far in this panel about just pitch, but if we're talking about guiding users and allowing a, a, an experience back and forth, I think timbre, and especially in like the uh, upping of the limit of people's, you know, the general public's acceptance of like harsh sounds, uh, what we'd, and then you get then you get in the, the whole semantics of what do you describe timbre as and that, all that stuff. But how do we incorporate the idea of musical expression through timbre more than just simplistic pitch and rhythmic constructs. We got, does everybody know what timbre is? Yes? This seems like, it's a, yeah. it seems like a small audience who really knows what they're talking about as far as music goes, so we're not going to explain yeah. timbre, but um, yeah, no, it's, it's the difference between uh, it's the difference between one style of music and another, like all of the different timbres of instruments. Like a lot of the times the notes are the same, the uh, rhythms are the same, the, the content is the same. You can even have the production be the same but the overall sounds of what the instruments are making connect to people in different ways to an incredibly polarizing point, which is silly, because it's, it's, a, it's a harmonic spectrum that you're not even identifying notes in. I'm yeah. thinking back to the original Smule app, the, uh, the ocarina. It's like, that was something where there was this visceral one. connection between a human gesture and the timbre that comes out of it. You said, so you, so in, in a sense, it would seem like you have the ability sitting here in your chairs at work to sort of have influence on these things. Is that something you directly think about? Or are you more heavily pitch focused and you know, figuring out how to make happy mistakes because most musical mistakes are very unhappy mistakes? I'll, <laughs> I'll say we've been very much pitch centric with all of our recent stuff and I can't really talk to the future of stuff, but I don't know, John? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's interesting to put it in those terms, but we are very pitch centric. I mean, we <laughs> I've been pushing for the drums app for a while, man. I want I want the DJ drums producer app, but um it's not coming this year. Um but yes, I I think uh timbre is is uh is not quite I don't know. It's not in the uh the consciousness yet in that way, you know, for better or for worse. Uh it is to the degree of like that I mean the instrument that you're 
choosing to a degree. Like if, if you have an That's app, true. for example, like, uh, like in session mode in Rocksmith, you, you get to choose between the different guitars and some of them actually share riffs. Some of them are literally playing the same thing. So the difference between, not all of them, we have a ton of riffs, but the difference between one instrument and another instrument could just literally be the tone that we put on the chain, basically the amp that they're going through. Uh, but that's enough to make you go, yeah, that's my metal guitar. That's the one I'm playing with. That's what I relate to. Um, I just wanted to say I, I absolutely loved the Ocarina app. I remember, like, the first iPhone that I got, I don't know if it was the, if it came out on the original or how, how early it came out. I don't exactly remember, but I was playing with it for so long, and then, uh, like, for hours, and I flipped over to the other view and realized that there was the world, and I could listen to other people, and immediately got freaked out that m that someone could have been listening to my horrible, horrible, happy accidents. <laughs> um, but it was also a, another moment of being really, like, uh, that was when I saw, like, oh, man, this is such a cool thing. I'm actually, like, connected to all these other people. I can listen to this random girl in Japan play the Zelda theme perfectly, uh, which drove me crazy because I couldn't do it. Uh, but I, I just, that was like a moment of seeing like, wow, this is where, this is where music is going. Like actually being able to connect with people again in this way. Yeah. The ocarina, by the way, it's like a flute, basically. It is that flute in The Legend of Zelda. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't reproduce the sound. I'm not going to try, but. <laughs> so like with, with auto rap and with say like effects loadouts that you're doing uh, in Rocksmith, I think there's an aspect that you are, uh, to which you're taking genre conventions and kind of formalizing them and then letting people sort of reflect those back at them. Um, how much do you uh, like put into trying to understand the kinds of guitar sounds that you want to have and how those are sort of related to genre? Oh, and how much does uh, sort of genre convention impact the kind of stuff that Shmuel's making? So uh, at least at Rocksmith, we have, a, we have a guy, Brendan West, who is like the gear dude. He's got, he's got he, any band that you bring up with him, he knows what piece of gear they used, how they used it, how they wired it together. And that's super important for Rocksmith because we have all the individual pieces of it, right? And we call them authentic tones. We call them authentic cones because we do an incredible amount of research to make sure that what you're putting in there, whether it's licensed gear or um, something that, you know, it represents uh, gear that they used, uh, is as accurate as possible. So we know like, oh, this distortion pedal literally did come before that wah, literally did do this, and like we actually look up video evidence and stuff. So it's very important. We don't really make any assumptions like metal guitarists use this, or you know, these type of classic rock guitarists use these. We go to the source and say, this is, this is how it was. This, they, they were using this, this amp. And like for the licensed gear that we do have in game, we hook them up with those. You know, it's, it's like they were using that 1969 Marshall with the, with the slanted cab in this configuration with the microphone position like that. It's that is a great question because in Auto Wrap we had something where the app was very like the project managers were very protective and like no it's only going to be hip hop and like R&B and co co content and stuff that is very you, qu you can quantize rap to really easily and then there's a hook that you that auto tunes to in the choruses and then just recently we we started flipping it we put all about that bass in, in auto rap you know we have country tunes in auto rap and taking stuff that never had rapping associated with it in any way and allowing the algorithm that's exactly the same to chop up someone's vocals add and now that <laughs> that Florida Georgia line song is totally a rap and we didn't change anything to the structure of the song except for adding the the vocal element and it was super cool to see that and they've actually been super popular though it's impossible to gauge really is that just because all about that bass was the number one song for right right three months. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. yeah yeah enough <laughs> in general, music allows you a lot of awesome, uh, oh my god, WTF moments, right? Like uh, one of my uh, favorite bands a couple, couple of years ago, it's not a band, it's a guy, uh, Girl Talk, and he just, he went and using Ableton, Ableton Live, the empowering a generation to make a style of music that would have never existed otherwise, uh, hacked up all of these songs and just put them together and blended all between them and made incredibly intelligent, like quick blends between stuff. And if you ever listen to it, it's like an album, like it's like an hour and a half of just straight, nothing but constant, like only the hits dance music that he's just blending to. It's, it's mashup stuff, but like... A bit much. Yeah. 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 Well, well like, I mean, it's an hour and a half and then you're like <laughs> done. But, um, but having those, being able to combine things in, in 
in hilarious or like uh, ways that you wouldn't have expected is like a huge part about music. Like that's why in, in with Rocksmith with session mode, it's it's a mode where you get to play with an AI band. You can hook it up however you want and play with it, and they actually listen and adapt to you. This is the short of it. Uh, but you have 76 instruments to kind of choose between and hook them up however you want. So it's like yeah, we we organized them into genres that were again uh, genres we derived from the gear that we know that people use. But at the same time, you can put the metal guitar with the upright bass and the and the uh, world percussion drums, and then with a click, if you want to play with a click for some reason, or with a kazoo, or with wind, you know, like you can combine this however you want, and then set it in harmonic minor and make it the weirdest, most epic kind of emo thing possible, and it's it's hilarious, like giving people the ability to do that, it's like, it's another way of connecting to music. I mean, you guys know the the hilarity of the musician joke, right? that the average person doesn't get when it, like, the punchline is like, and then he was using the pentatonic minor. It's like, oh my god. To get back to that question, David, could you answer maybe what, how much does the, the genre drive, probably at least you could tell about the content releases, right? We must think about that a lot. Yeah, so, it's, it's is popular, kind of crazy to is think pop about. pop actually the most popular Because like when you have 20 million active users at any one time, thinking about what the whole broad spectrum of them are going to be interested in and the niches and applying to them and then all that is, is tough. And so, yes, you have to get the, the pop, the Hot 100 content and all that and the stuff that resonates with the pop culture and is even number one in Brazil, and, you know. Uh, but, you know, we're putting in, uh, we're, we're coordinating with the Icelandic Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and putting in this really awesome flamboyant um, Paul Oscar. You know, we're putting his music in because you have, when you have such a niche thing, like we were ta you were talking about that awesome 18.10 system that can yeah, yeah. noise music. You know, if that was, everyone that was there, I'm guessing was super into it. Like no one's like, ah, eh, yeah, like Only I guess. Only in San Francisco yeah. or something like that. Exists. <laughs> right. So like the people that are gonna go sing that Icelandic music, even though the country only has 300,000 people, like <laughs> they're gonna be so into it, and that's like that's awesome. Cool. Uh, one last final thing before we take a, a few questions. Uh, I've just been having a fun time listening to this. <laughs> um, you know, obviously, you know. Technology has changed music making fundamentally, you know, probably since people were banging bones together from you know, when the piano forte was invented and you could suddenly play both soft piano and loud forte, or the engineers said, well, Mr. Guitar Player, you can plug it into this, that, but just make, don't turn the volume past about eight because then you won't get an accurate representation of your guitar sound and it, it will distort, which of course is bad. Um, technology has we still gave changed you the that goes to fundamentally <laughs> the kind of music that is that is made. How do you see, just sort of in a, in a quick wrap-up uh, thought, what you are doing as fundamentally changing the nature of humanity and through music? <laughs> I think that's a hard question one at all. Sentence, one <laughs> sentence answer. No. Certainly there's a lot of pieces of music technology that have created genres, right? I think we wouldn't have what we think of as contemporary electronic music without the TV 303 and the 808, right? These are, these are things that, that have enabled particular types of expression. And I think, you know, if, if there's like a lofty aim that I could possibly have for a thing that I would build, you know, it's a thing that, that is expressive within a limited set of means that can, you know, sort of be generative of its own type of genre work. Because I think genre is a, a powerful way of limiting a palette and allowing someone to sort of identify with the thing that they've made as part of that genre. Uh, and I think, you know, that's sort of a big part of, you know, what, we, what we're doing when we're playing around with remixing a Fantasia, um, but a thing that, you know, from a, a long-term perspective, I sort of aspire to be able to, to create kind of an environment that has its own sound and its own feel uh, that, you know, is, is generative of a particular type of genre of music. Uh, for us, we view music as the original social network, and which is kind of a, a buzz phrase, but I think it encapsulates what we're gonna try and do going forward. And that is completely to take this community that has kind of built itself and that we've nursed along of people that are all casual or closet singers that are, um, are all collaborating together and 700 people sing a group duet of happy and all the stuff that's happening without us even pushing it, we're gonna keep massaging that and pushing that further and uh, you know, pushing this collaborative environment to a point where people don't need to worry so much about sounding bad because 
you have a positive community behind him. And just the idea that music can be good, it can be bad, but it can be expressive no matter what it is in there. And it can be incredibly personal and incredibly connecting to a huge number of people across cultural boundaries, across a whole bunch of different boundaries. And I think going towards the future, yes, it's more about connecting all those people amongst all the different instruments and the different personalities and everything and using uh, music as a conduit for that. I got three points. Let me see if I remember them all when going through this, because I thought of it while you started speaking. Now that might be gone. Uh, first one is... <laughs> I just screwed myself. I knew it a second ago. Um, first thing is the... I think we're actually coming up to... Like, I feel like we're behind where music used to be. And this is maybe just an idea I just started thinking about now when you were talking about, like, oh, uh, you know, people used to get around the piano and play songs and sing together. I really feel like what we're doing now with the music applications is kind of getting people back together, connecting people back to music again, which is something that uh, is actually, I feel in a lot of ways, actually departed from our culture. and Or not departed, but definitely gone to an individual basis instead of kind of connecting as a community. So in one way, I see that that's, that's where we're going, uh, but that's just to get us back to ground zero, which is nice. Uh, second thing is that uh, second and third thing at the same time, I feel that new instruments or new ways of connecting with music are literally new windows into creating music. Like, this is why a lot of musicians, and I'm sure you guys know, like, you maybe started with guitar, or you started with piano, but then there was some point where you're like, I want to learn how to play drums, I want to learn how to play bass, I want to learn how to play this. Like, it just, this natural inclination came out, and you started to play with those instru other instruments, and it made you play different, it made you play different things, you thought up different ideas, you started making music in a different way. That's incredibly important. So all of these new uh, things that we come up with, whether it's controlling it on an iPad or uh, a controller or a DJ thing, or maybe just even clicking around with a mouse in a DAW, all those different ways are actually influencing how music sounds, like you were talking about with the 808 or with live or things like that. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna say is where we, the, all of us, are actually pushing music technology, specifically in the field of games, but pushing this music technology gives the kind of like, uh, gives the, the pro audio user more technology to make things, to make different tools and different things that actually didn't exist before, to get to kind of experiences that um, are new, right? Like a lot of the, a lot of the tech that I know you've made with um, going through and actually analyzing the, the raps and stuff like that, or the stuff we've done with session mode, uh, uh, it, in the way, you're going to make a product. And then when you're done making that product, you're like, huh, we had to make a lot of tools to get here. And you can actually wire them together this way. And it's like a way of growing on where you're at uh, to actually make more tools to then go to the second point to make music in a different way and actually bring it further. Well, this, this probably overlaps a lot with those guys. But definitely uh, filling in the gaps between traditional instruments and um, what Nick was describing as a solitary EDM producer in his bedroom. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, you know, um, a lot more different ways for people to make music at different levels of commitment from the, like, I just want to tap the phone in time versus, like, I actually am going to, like, dedicate years of my life to learning an instrument, right? There's a huge range of people in between there, the guys who have given up on guitar twice. Um, so we can make tools for those people and let them, you know, keep making music instead of, like, have you ever had that conversation, like, oh, you know, I really wish I still played guitar. Like, oh, like, we got you, bro. Like, <laughs> here, use this, you know. We're making that kind of stuff to fill in the gaps. Um, and I, I hopefully it'll be at all, at all ranges, from the amateur up to the professional, and making those tools a little, you know, more usable so you don't have to, you know, dig through a, like, synthesizer manual to, like, learn, like, what the hell does this one knob do and why can't I hear any differences? Like, actually, we don't really need to show you that, so we're not going to, you know. Um, also, uh, I think Adult Contemporary is going to make a big comeback. Ryan? <laughs> see. Adult Contemporary is going to make a big comeback. <laughs> got to write that one down. Uh, I think we've got time for a question or two. If anybody's got uh, something, then we're going to have to wrap up or go to the wrap up room. Hi there. First of all, I just want to say, hmm? Finger? Was no, it? sorry, I was communicating with back. Okay. There. That's good. All right, first of all, I just want to say thank you like, to everybody because like, I'm. Like, I started off doing music, like, with these rhythm games. Like, I started off with music games. Like, that's my bread and butter. That's what I just love to do. If it weren't for those, like, if it weren't for, like, Amplitude or Rocksmith or Rock Band or 
sing or guitar or anybody else just keeping up this genre of game that seems to be dying, I think. I mean, I think it's, I mean, I just want to thank you guys, like, so much, because, like, this is just such a big part of my life. Uh, the question, like, since I'm such a big part of the community, I, of the music game community, I know that a huge part of it is, of the fan base is to have, like, original, like, user-created content, whether it's, like, creating your own songs and implementing them in the game, which is a little bit rare, or if you just, like, take, like, MP3s off of the internet and just, like, throw them into Tap Tap Revenge or something. Because I know that that's such a huge part of just, like, the grassroots community. But in my conversations that I've had with developers, it seems like it's difficult to acknowledge that that's even happening. Because, like, you can't just say, hey, look at this cool dude who took a thrift shop MP3 and just put it in our game. Because then you get, because then you're condoning piracy and then you have a whole bunch of copyright issues to deal with because you're not paying, like, you're not licensing their music. So my question is, do you really see this user-generated content as more of a boon to the game or more like a hindrance? And is there a way to um, promote this user-generated content without overstepping copyright boundaries? Wait, a that's very a super good question. It lends itself to a whole panel discussion. We have enough time for quick answers, uh, and uh, then we'd, let's, we need to take it up into the hallway or the wrap-up. I'll absolutely talk to you outside of this, yes. except to say that we can't say much except you're absolutely right, and okay. you may be happy in the future. Uh, <laughs> I, I, so I don't know what any of his questions means. You. Uh, I'm going to say that you don't ask the, the easiest questions out on, <laughs> on a panel. <laughs> I know, um, it's a mouthful. We tried really hard to absorb that energy with uh, Rock Band Network in the height of the Rock Band days, let people offer their own content, <laughs> offer it up for sale. Uh, it's a thing we knew was, were, was happening and we wanted to have happen, and you know, we ideally in the future will continue to support. Mm, great. We love the community's input. It makes uh, Rocksmith so much, so much better to have a really strong community, and we've actually been fortunate to have people who care so much. Mm -hmm. um, and we like that community input, and we like having people actually help each other and do that. Great. It's great to hear. Thank you. Right. So, yeah, I'd like to thank Matt, uh, John, Nick, and David. Thanks for uh, spending your time here. And I think this is the end of the GDC audio track for 2015. Mm -hmm. All right. Made it.